thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary Falls. Thank you for inviting me to this conference. It is a great pleasure and an honor. I uh, had the pleasure, actually, uh, some years ago, 1995, actually, the spring of 1995, to share an office with uh, Godemont uh, at Jussieu. And uh, he, I, I didn't really know him before that, and I, I, he was just an absolutely charming and extremely interesting person. And um, uh, it, it was a great pleasure to know him, uh, to meet him at that time. Um, Zeta functions, I, I guess I chose the title uh, because uh, these days, um, perhaps the notion of a Zeta function is um, one of the mathematical mathematical concepts that is m most cl closely associated with Godemont, uh, I guess because of the volume with Jacquet. And so what I would like to do is to talk, uh, this, this would be sort of an introduction to uh, the program of Langlands, uh, uh, which is, uh, goes by the name of Beyond Endoscopy. And it is, a, I guess it's a, it's a strategy or maybe a dream of Langlands uh, that is probably close to 20 years old now, uh, to try to attack the general principle of functoriality by means of the trace formula, but to apply the trace formula in a, in a very different way than it has ever been applied before, to combine the trace formula with automorphic L functions. Well, I won't talk about the general sort of premises of this program. Um, it's, 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 it would, it's quite a lot, I mean, even to just describe that might be two or three lectures. So I'm going to talk about a very specific question, which is probably the first major step that has to, would have to be accomplished. Um, this, is, this is, I mean, there are other uh, possible ways of looking at it, uh, the language, the, the beyond endoscopy, but the, the Proposal, the actual proposal of Langlands, what I'm going to talk about would be, I think, the first major step that would have to be accomplished before you could go on. And it has to do, well, it has to do with a part of the trace formula. And um, specifically, um, specifically, uh, it's, it's, there are problems for the most basic terms in the trace formula, on the geometric side of the trace formula. And these somehow have to be solved first before one can look at the more exotic terms. So let me just recall some of these ba the basic terms, the primary terms in, in the trace formula. So this is just going to be an approximation of the trace formula. And so I, in particular, I will confine it to GLN. Uh, actually, I think maybe I'll take it for GLN plus one. The parametrization is a little uh, simpler. Uh, the things I'm going to talk about are a little bit simpler to describe in the case of GLN plus one. Um, it's over Q, so again, it's a very straightforward case. And I would take a test function f. Trace formula, of course, depends on a function. So a test function f uh, on GA. And let's divide out by a central subgroup to make it have an actual discrete spectrum. Uh, Z plus it would be the, let's say, the real scalar matrices in which um, R is a positive real number. This is a subgroup uh, of GR, the real points of the group, which is a subgroup of the adelic points. So it's a central subgroup of GA. And so we'd be interested in functions that are Z plus invariant. So the general trace formula is a, a, a general kind of expansion between terms that have some sort of geometric origin, distributions that have some sort of geometric origin. Actually, it's probably better if I put it 
on a separate board. Um, in fact, I will. You have seven different boards. Uh, yes, I, I'm trying to budget my space here. So yeah. let's put it here. I've got the stick, yes. And I've seen other people use the stick very well, so I, I'm, uh, I've got that in mind. But the trace formula, it's a, it's a formula. I'm going to, this one's a little more brighter, easier to see. So it's a general expansion uh, between, uh, a general identity between a sum of uh, geometric terms. and a sum of spectral terms. <coughs> now, uh, what um, the, the, in some sense, the, the primary uh, geometric terms, so um, uh, this is equal to, um, so the whole thing is equal to an elliptic expansion, um, elliptic regular terms, plus a whole lot of more complicated supplementary uh, geometric terms. So that's what this is equal to. And this uh, is equal to uh, the discrete uh, part the basically the thing that you really are interested in the discrete uh, part of the um, uh, uh, spectral decomposition um, let's write that as i2 of f plus supplementary um, spectral terms okay so that's equal to this and uh, the 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 terms that have to really be understood, the basic problems that have to be understood before you can do anything else, and in fact some of the most important problems, have to do with these basic elliptic regular terms, which I recall are of the form, it's, a, it's, a, it's basically what sh the matches what you'd get for the trace formula of compact quotient. So a sum of elements gamma in elliptic regular conjugacy classes of G of um, a volume term and an orbital integral. So that is just um, um, that is just this thing here. And uh, these things, this stands for elliptic regular conjugacy classes. In GQ, uh, this thing I recall. Uh, th so that's what this is. Uh, this is uh, the volume of uh, centralizers. So that's the volume of the quotient of G gamma for a given gamma. That's the uh, quotient of Z plus times G gamma sitting in G gamma Q, sitting in G cam gamma A. That's what this thing is. And this thing is the orbital integral. So this is um, equal to the integral taken too much space for the volume quotient, and I need a little more space just to recall the orbital integral. So that's the integral of G gamma A uh, divided into uh, G um, A of f of x to the minus 1 gamma x dx. That's I recall that's what this term is. And let me just, I won't say too much about these. These are, this is what you really uh, are interested in. So that this is the sum over pi um, in um, 
that let me write it as pi 2 of g, um, uh, multiplicities of pi in um, the uh, L2, the discrete spectrum sitting in the L2 of GA modulo GQ times the character, the trace of pi of f. Now that's just, that's, I'm just talking about what this is here. And uh, this, uh, by, by this I, I just mean the set of irreducible representations um, which are contained in the discrete spectrum of L2 Z plus um, uh, GQ GA. So these are th these are what you really want. This is the uh, uh, this is the essence of functoriality to understand relations among these representations in the discrete spectrum as the group G varies in a in a very natural way. Uh, that's what functoriality applies to, and these are some in some sense the. Uh, uh, parallel terms to the discrete spectrum on the, spect uh, on the spectral side. Um, so this is, that's what this is equal to, and this is, this is I'm not writing this very clearly, that's what uh, this is equal to. And that's why it keeps Jones on both sides. Uh, plus, uh, plus supplement, let's call them supplets, let's so, so this is just equal to this, and I'm not saying anything about these supplementary terms. All right. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write. Um, I'm going to write the elliptic regular part. Um, I'm going, to, I'm going to write this approximation little symbol. Uh, this is equal approximately, well, to I2 of f. And so this is the famous, the notorious, pretend that they're equal symbol. But I'm not going to talk about the even the spectral side. I'm going to just uh, describe the uh, initial steps that you would like to apply uh, to the primary geometric terms, this thing here. So what I'll do is I will put this at the top. And we'll just have it there. I'll come back to it at some point. but. Um, try to discuss uh, what we, the kind of things we would like to do um, with those terms. Those terms by, that have somehow always been treated as a kind of black box. Um, they have been uh, endoscopy, the theory of endoscopy, for example, compares these terms for a given group G with another group, maybe an endoscopic group, uh, G prime. But one doesn't sort of look at the internal structure so much of these terms. I mean, there have been questions. But what uh, is needed here is to really understand, uh, to, to, to really um, understand that there seems to be a, an internal structure to these elliptic regular terms that really has to be understood before one can proceed further. Um, so perhaps the first thing to say about them is a proposal or suggestion in a paper of Frankel uh, Langlands and Go. And it seems a harmless enough uh, suggestion, uh, but it's, it's a kind of a notational uh, slash um, 
kind of philosophical proposal. It's to replace the, an element gamma, a regular uh, elliptic semi-simple element in GQ. to replace it by its characteristic polynomial. You mean in the adjoint representation? Uh, no, just for, this is just for GLM. Uh, so so you'd, you'd have to take uh, the construction of Steinberg and uh, Hitchin uh, in general. So, but I'm just talking about GLM, so it really is just a characteristic polynomial. Uh, of the matrix, yep, uh, P gamma of lambda, um, the determinant, lambda i uh, minus gamma. So uh, let me write it lambda n plus 1 uh, minus a1 lambda to the n, and so on, plus minus 1 to the n, a n uh, lambda. Um, uh, plus minus 1 to the n plus 1, a n plus 1. Um, so let's, uh, we can also parametrize it by a, where a is this uh, vector of, uh, of uh, rational numbers. This is the, this would be the determinant of the matrix. So let's write it, uh, let's keep that separate. So it's uh, numbers, let's say, b1 up to bn, uh, a n plus 1, or just a vector b and the number a n plus 1, where uh, b, um, um, uh, this b is going to be an arbitrary rational number. And bn plus 1 has to be a non-zero rational number. Well, I say arbitrary, but that's not quite right, because I'm dealing with elliptic conjugacy classes. And that's uh, to say, uh, precisely, that this characteristic polynomial is irreducible over the rational numbers. So we are then, the, pr the proposal uh, of, uh, uh, in this, paper of these uh, three authors is to identify an element gamma with an element A in um, Qn cross Q star um, with the property that this polynomial P um, a of lambda is irreducible over Q. And gamma of two conjugacy, of course. Gamma, yes. So, so did I? Yeah. yeah, yeah. These are supposed to be conjugacy class, semi-simple, okay. regular conjugacy classes. Elements gamma whose centralizer is a torus, and that uh, that translates. Uh, uh, elliptic elements translates to the requirement that the characteristic polynomial be irreducible. Well, let me make an even uh, further simplification. The, re the, the, the essential problems um, can be seen even in this further simplification. Let me write, uh, let me suppose that f is a product of a, an Archimedean function and uh, a piadic, a product of piadic functions, where uh, f infinity, so f infinity then would be a smooth function of compact support. So I'm dividing out by the center. And where um, um, f infinity, upper infinity, is the unit function in at all of the piadic places. So the characteristic function, so let me write it like this, the um, uh, i upper infinity 
or in other words, the product over P of I P, where um, um, this is the characteristic function. So I P is equal to, um, so this would be the characteristic function of the product over all P of uh, GL n plus 1 of Zp. So that's a perfectly good function to put into the trace formula. Um, okay, I'll cover up the trace formula just momentarily, and we'll pull it down when we need it. Um, Um, then if I do this, gamma, um, and, and furthermore, I would like to restrict myself simply to, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to take uh, 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 the test function to be this restricted form, and uh, let me consider only those gamma, um, such that O gamma of F, so that's going to be the product of O gamma orbital integral of gamma of F infinity times the product over all P of orbital integrals um, of these p adic unit functions, and let me just simply restrict myself to elements gamma for which those are non-zero. And then, by so doing, I would then be considering... O is orbital integral. Pardon me? O is orbital integral. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, I think I called it... This is orb. And so by making that restriction, then I'm asking, I'm looking at elements gamma that are bijective with vectors A. So uh, that would let me write it like this, vectors A that consist of pairs where B is now an element not just in Q to the n, but rather Z to the n, and epsilon is then uh, the determinant of gamma, and so that would be equal to plus or minus 1. Integral matrices. Integral matrices, yes. So I guess what I want to say is that this is, is a really fundamental, I mean it seems to me, this is a fundamental change in outlook. In the past, we're thinking of the elliptic terms in the trace formula as parametrized by extensions of degree n plus 1, and then elements in those extensions that, um, uh, well, that whose centralizer is, is just a torus. Here we're looking, we're thinking of them differently. We're thinking of them in an entirely elementary way as polynomials parametrized by these integers. So integral uh, polynomials with constant term plus or minus 1 um, which are irreducible over Q. So these are kind of, this is kind of like the olden days, maybe in Galois theory, where you don't know what the fields are, you just uh, are thinking of polynomials, um, and fields are somehow hidden. There, there are things that you uh, don't know about, and you're just going to try to work with your bare hands with polynomials. Uh, whether, uh, uh, I mean, it's in intriguing to try to imagine uh, when you try to analyze the structure, I mean, I don't have any evidence for what I'm about to say, but it's intriguing to think that if you're going to try to analyze the elliptic part of the trace formula in these terms, uh, it could be that the actual Galois group of the um, polynomial that you're considering is, uh, well, it's of course a subgroup of the symmetric group, but the actual, what actual Galois group you get, it's intriguing to wonder what that might have to do with the uh, with the trace formula.
So maybe it's, I mean, it might have, it's kind of has a flavor of 19th century um, Galois theory, uh, theory of equations, maybe Galois resolvents. But I don't have any evidence for that, but it's, it's sort of intriguing. And so one consequence of this change of outlook is uh, So I mentioned that uh, Langland's proposal for beyond endoscopy um, concerns uh, uh, combining the trace formula with automorphic L functions. Now, if I were talking about sort of the sort of general uh, ideas that you hope might follow from this, I would be talking about the spectral side and uh, automorphic uh, L functions of the, uh, the idea of Langlands is to combine the trace formula with automorphic L functions of the representations that are supposed to occur on the spectral side. So I'm not going to be talking about that. What I'm talking, what I want to talk about here are L functions, but not on the spectral side, more elementary things, simply the zeta functions of the terms that occur uh, on the geometric side. So those are the zeta functions that I'm, were in my title. Uh, for a start, for a start, for a start. <laughs> so zeta functions. Okay, so for that, suppose you're given um, an element gamma as above, a pair B uh, epsilon. Um, we, of course, have the field uh, that uh, comes from gamma, where the uh, coordinates of gamma lie. This is what we're not going to have, be looking at explicitly uh, so much as I've said from now on, but we do have this field. So, of course, it's Q of lambda modulo the ideal generated by P gamma lambda. So E over Q is an extension of degree n plus 1. And it has the property that the centralizer group that I mentioned at the beginning is the multiplicative group of E. But we have something else now. If we're going to be changing this little, this kind of philosophical change, we have something else besides E. We have R, so this is, I'm going to write it as R of gamma, and so this is not Q of lambda, modulo this, but Z of lambda, modulo P gamma of lambda, the ideal generated by this. So this is contained in the ring of integers of E, and so this is, uh, I didn't know this, uh, before I started thinking about these things, I didn't know this term, but very basic term. This is called an order in OE. By Dedekind. Oh, is that Dedekind? I see, I see. So he was on to this. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> so what's uh, uh, relevant to both of these situations and is uh, particularly important, I guess, is the uh, discriminant. So the discriminant of the order, there's a, a discriminant of the order, and there's also a discriminant of the field. I want to take their absolute values in both cases, and then this is the discriminant, it's the same thing as the discriminant actually of the polynomial, the characteristic polynomial, P gamma of lambda. This is the discriminant of the field, and the two are not equal, um, there's a, 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 an index of the order uh, that is a positive, uh, the square of a positive integer. So this is, uh, I, uh, sigma r is a positive integer, and I guess this is often called the index. And those objects seem to be absolutely fundamental to um, 
understanding what we would like to would we like to understand of these um, of these terms. All right, so zeta functions. We've got the Dedekind zeta function. Um, of the field E. So I recall that that's equal to, a, it has an Euler, of course, has an Euler product, the product over all primes of local uh, Dedekind zeta functions, local components. And so that would be the product over P of um, there's a product over all prime ideals in E um, above P. So P in OE prime. Um, so P, script P divides little p of 1 minus the norm E over Q of P to the minus 1. That's the Euler product of this Dedekind zeta function. S. Uh, S, uh, yes. Minus S. So that's the Euler product of this zeta function. It also has a Dirichlet series. Um, zeta E of S. Um, so it's a sum over uh, ideals, um, integral ideals um, in OF, excuse me, OE, um, of norm E over Q of uh, L um, to the minus S which you then can write out as a sum um, by taking these norms as a sum, as an actual Dirichlet series, as a sum of uh, over positive integers n. And it has a functional equation. Uh, let's write it like this, lambda, so I'm calling this zeta of e. Let me write lambda of e of s. That's equal to lambda e of 1 minus s, where um, lambda e of s is equal to, so it's just you, you, the way the notation that I've used here does not include the Euler fact, the Archimedean Euler factor that would need, be needed for the functional equation. So it'd be zeta, you could write it as zeta e of infinity times zeta e over s. And so this is an Euler factor given by various gamma factors. But the zeta function I really wanted to talk about, I'm not going as fast as I should be, but the zeta function I really wanted to talk about is not the Dedekind zeta function, but it's a, it's a, it seems completely new. Um, it's by, um, this is by, it's by Ziwei Yun. So it's Yun's zeta function of the order R. So this certainly was completely new to me. It's about five, three or four, maybe five years old. Uh, he credits actually Collins, the paper of Colin Bushnell for uh, motivation. Um, uh, but uh, his zeta function is a generalization of the zeta function, uh, which reduces to the zeta function when the order uh, is equal simply to the ring of integers OE in the in the in the field. So it's a it's a, let's write it as zeta R of S, R being this order, and it uh, it has many of the same properties. It has an Euler product um, zeta R P of S. Um, so he actually, so I'm not going to give you the, I, I won't give the definition of it, 
but uh, these Euler factors um, are given by uh, a Dirichlet series as these are, and this is this is uh, this local Euler factor for the Dedekind zeta function is a Dirichlet series. Uh, it's a generating <coughs> function whereby you count the number of um, OE modules uh, of a given um, uh, length. Uh, uh, of a given size, and you, you count the number of such things, and you raise that, uh, you, that would be the coefficient, and you uh, multiply that by um, p to the minus n s, where n is the length of those modules. This is defined in the same way, um, where you take, you don't take O e modules, namely ideals, but you take uh, r modules. And I think you count them, um, you ask for R modules which uh, are contained actually in the dual um, uh, uh, R check, which is uh, uh, the dual of, of this as an R module over itself. And that's something that con would contain OE. I'm not comfortable with these things, I didn't grow up. Uh, learning the details of commutative algebra, but there's a generating function. Uh, he defines it in a simple way as a generating function uh, in by which you count um, certain um, R modules um, according to their length, how big they are. Pardon me? It might have been known to Hasse. Is that so? Is that so? Okay, <coughs> you mean the, you mean this this zeta function? Yeah, yes. Okay, well let me let me wait. Well, I got there's some punchlines that he introduced. A very uh, so. Um, I did not check. I did not check. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So um, in any case, zeta r of p of s, um, it should be very closely related to the corresponding local factor for the Dedekind zeta function. It actually differs from it by a polynomial of um, uh, in p to the minus s. So it's, it's of the form um, p r, I'm going to write it as p r of p of q to the mi of p to the minus s. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a, mod it's a modification, a multiplicative modification of the local factor for the Dedekind zeta function, it's a local factor, where uh, for a polynomial, p r of t. Um, so this would be, this is a polynomial with um, constant term, <coughs> excuse me, constant term one and with integral coefficients. sorry, uh, of degree uh, basically given in terms of the discriminant uh, or the local component of the discriminant. So there's a polynomial of degree. So I'm going to write it like this. It's a polynomial of degree 2 delta of p, where delta is the valuation um, of the p part of this integer. Um, uh, this integer sigma here, this integer there. So delta p, um, so delta or delta p, or we, if we want, we can index it by r, delta r p. This is equal to the valuation um, at p of sigma of r. All right, so that's, that's what the he is introduced. And the product, so this is of course, that's the local factor that is introduced initially, that's this thing here. The product, um, which is still concerning the local factor, but the product, I'm, and Let's write it as zeta tilde r of p of s. So you take, basically, you take the local factor, but you actually, uh, rather than having a polynomial, you have it with some negative pow positive powers as well as negative powers. Uh, so p to the delta of s, 
um, times this polynomial, that's the um, new factor in the, in the function, uh, p uh, r p uh, at p to the minus s. So this is, a, this is a sentence. This is a long sentence. The product of this thing, we know what that is. This is the thing that comes in here. And you've put its value at p to the minus s. That product um, satisfies two things. It has a functional equation. It has its own, it's just a local factor, but it has its own functional equation. Zeta r p tilde of s is equal to zeta r p tilde of 1 minus s. So it's got its own. The Euler factors of an L function or a Dedekind zeta function don't satisfy that functional equation. But this uh, obstruction or this difference between the Dedekind zeta function's local factor and the Yun zeta function's local factor does satisfy this functional equation. So you, you don't want z multiply z by zeta r p of s and it is a tilde? Oh, do I have I forgotten a tilde up here? I have, yes. You have no zeta e p. Yes. I don't think you do. I think it's. I think it's okay. I think it's all right. That's the first factor that comes out in front of the maximum. Yeah, I think. I think that's so. This is the definition, or this is the property of this. This. This is the property of this slightly different. Oh. Yeah, I forgot something. Yes, yes, you're. Now I've got this one, this thing here. No, no, I think I think this is what I want. I think this is. I think you're fine. Yes, yes. I memory is thirty years old. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> that's 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 impressive. <laughs> all right. And now here, to me anyway, this was the this was the. This was what was really surprising. So this local factor satisfies a functional equation, but it also has a, a very interesting property uh, for its value at 1. So the local, this local correction factor has the property that its value at 1 is equal to something that is very central to the trace formula. Namely, it's the orbital integral of gamma at 1p. It's a p-adic orbital integral. Which uh, seems like a real surprise. What happens when you take for r the full ring of integers? Uh, you have the orbital integral of an element gamma whose... But for the first... For, uh, it's assertion one. one. Assertion one. When R is a, a ring of integers. Uh, it's just one. It's just one, identically equal to one. So the in that case, the Dedekind, uh, the Yun zeta function reduces to the Dedekind zeta function. So, so well, assertion <coughs> one. This requires a normalization on the right hand side. Can you say one word? Um, it does, and. Um, uh, uh, I think he uses maybe one, the normalization that you may not want to use eventually, but I think it's the normalization which assigns volume one to uh, the centralizer of gamma. Um, to, to, to uh, assigns volume one, for example. Yes, yes. So are you assuming this real part of this is greater than one in the first part? Sorry? Position one. Are you assuming real part of this is greater than one? Here? Yeah. But this is this is for all s. For all s. For all s. 
I mean, it has func it has yeah. it's an analytic function. It's a meromorphic function. Yes. And the product uh, defining zeta r is over what over all prime p of uh, OE. Uh, yes, it's a product over all prime p. That's that's right. It's just a modification of the. It is a modification of the that it can zeta function. All right. So what is this from one? One immediately leads to uh, an identity. Well, it, it leads to a functional equation of the global of Yun's global L function. Um, where uh, lambda r of s is basically, uh, it's, it's again, you tack on essentially the same Euler factor. Um, actually, you need to modify it very slightly by uh, this number uh, attached to the discriminant of the order, zeta r to the s, zeta infinity. So you need to modify the, or the Euler factor um, of the dedicate zeta function slightly by just the power of this thing. Uh, but then, just from this property, you see that you're going to get a the same function. The gamma factor remains the same. The gamma factor remains the same. It's just At so infinity, you see nothing. You see nothing, yes, yes. All right, and uh, let me just also add that Let me add that uh, from two, um, I'll put it here maybe. So from two, I'm just rewriting basically. Uh, um, uh, that w relation to in terms of the original um, Euler factor. So the orbital integral of gamma at p is equal to p to the delta times zeta e p of 1 to the minus 1 zeta r of p 1. So this is the Euler factor at 1 for the Dedekind zeta function. Uh, this is the Euler factor at 1 for the Dedekind zeta function. This is the Euler factor at 1 for this new zeta function. It's multiplied by this normalizer, and uh, that is the orbital integral. So the orbital integral is basically, at least at value 1, it measures uh, the difference, multiplicative difference, between this new kind of zeta function and the Dedekind zeta function. All right, um, just a couple of remarks. I'm, I'm, um, this is taking me longer than I expected, but um, I, uh, just a couple of notes. This function, uh, this zeta function, in a special case, has been known to analytic number theorists for some time. Um, Um, uh, in the case G equals GL2, it was introduced by Zagier. Well, essentially it's the same thing. Um, zeta, zeta R of S, it's really, really the quotient of what I have up there divided by the Riemann zeta function, and so what one gets in the, for the, in the case of Dedekind zeta function is just uh, quadratic uh, Dirac uh, Dirac-Clay L function, but modulo that difference. This was um, for GL two. This was introduced by Zagier, and other people have also studied it um, in 1977. For quadratic extensions of Q. You know, imaginary both. Pardon me? Quadratic extensions of you know, imaginary both. Both, both. both. Um, so this was, yeah, this was a starting point. Um, um, 
Oh, I, I guess what I would also say um, is, um, so this is a, a compound remark, the local factors um, uh, let's say zeta r p of s and the orbital integrals um, zeta tilde r p of 1 uh, these were um, they have they, these have simple formulas And uh, these uh, simple formulas uh, were a starting point um, for the recent work, uh, the thesis, part of the thesis of Ali Altu. So he did some extremely important work um, for the case of GL2. And I'm just going to say uh, they were a starting point for his work um, in establishing what I'll say, in establishing Poisson summation. For GL2. I may not get, I'm not going to get as much said as I had hoped, so I'll say that Poisson summation, you've got the, uh, the global orbital integrals are, in, are parametrized by elements in Zn. Zn, they're distributions that are parametrized by Zn. And the question, uh, a question that was later then posed in Langlands, Go and Frankel, can you apply Poisson summation? to that sum over Zn. In the case of GL2, it's just a sum over Z, and uh, L2 with some extremely clever, um, you can't apply Poisson summation at all as, as it stands just yet, but he did several very interesting things and was able to apply Poisson summation in the case of GL2. In the case G equals GLn, or GLN plus 1, um, the orbital integrals so this would be zeta tilde of R of P of 1, um, perhaps also the local factors so this, uh, the orbital integrals, there's less information here than are in the local factors because this would just be the local, essentially the local factors at s equals 1, but the local factors, so zeta tilde of r of p of s, um, these, I think it's fair to say, uh, certainly in the case that the order, we're talking now about a local order, so we can ask whether, it's a, uh, whether it is elliptic or whether it's hyperbolic. The uh, elliptic case would be the main one. Um, and then we can ask whether it's unramified, tamely ramified, or wildly ramified. And certainly up to tamely ramified, um, these seem to have explicit formulas And you're going to need such things very much so, explicit but very rich, I'm going to say um, richly, rather, richly complex functions. I haven't checked uh, everything. But um, I think it's pretty fair to say that these uh, that can be derived I've certainly done enough special cases to make me believe that uh, up to the tamely ramified case, these uh, <coughs> I expect to be able to, to derive such things from, well, from uh, some uh, two very striking papers of Balzberger.
germs. So uh, th this is not the title of the paper, but it's germs of p-adic orbital integrals. for GLN. Hmm. I have three minutes left. So what I would like to do, what I would, uh, um, I've been my three minutes, um, I want to return to the trace formula. Okay, so that's, well, it's up there. Um, All right, um, so uh, it's up there, I elliptic regular f is then going to be equal to a sum, the way we've originally written it, as a sum over gamma, volume of gamma, the orbital integral of uh, gamma f infinity, and the product over all p of orbital integrals, gamma of the unit element in the Hecke algebra. All right, so the idea would be to rewrite each of these three terms. You see, this is very, uh, this is very nicely uh, uh, matches what we uh, would get from Yun's zeta function. So this, the way we have set it up. We have taken a rigid function at the p-adic place, no room for varying it, just the characteristic function of the unit. This is the only thing that would be varied. And so we would regard this as a linear combination of distributions um, in f infinity with coefficients built out of this and this. Um, so we've got this. Uh, one would like to, uh, I'm going to just have to say a few words uh, to finish off. This is an Archimedean orbital integral. Um, these, of course, were studied by Harish Chandra. And um, it's best to normalize this by multiplying it by the square root of the absolute value of the vial discriminant. Now that fits very well with what we're dealing with here. The, the vial discriminant has the same absolute value as the, discrim as the discriminant of the characteristic polynomial of gamma. And so um, uh, you multiply it by that, and then you get something that is close to what Harris Chandra studied. Um, it's a function that has very mild singularities. This, um, uh, well, you, you do two things with that. You apply, um, and I'm following the strategy of uh, Al2 that he used for GL2. You use the class, Dirichlet's class number formula to rewrite this. So this is basically um, the regulator of the uh, 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 extension E of degree n plus 1. And you rewrite that as a product of the square root of the absolute value of the discriminant of the field extension uh, times the value or the residue of the uh, Dirichlet L function at 1. This you substitute in for uh, Yun's uh, uh, orbital integrals there. And you see that, that that matches very well with the values, uh, with, with, the discrim with the value of the Dirichlet L function, or rather its residue, at s equals 1. And if you put those two together, you have the residue of the Yun zeta function at 1. 
And so those two go together as a, as a one sort of common coefficient uh, times the orbital integral of this. So in that context, the question raised by Langlands and Go and Frankel uh, was to, uh, so, so you're going to have a sum over elements, not gamma, but you're going to have a sum over elements b, epsilon, and zn, cross plus or minus 1 of a, of a distribution in a variable function f infinity with very simple but uh, difficult coefficients, namely uh, basically the residue of this, uh, uh, or if you prefer, the, the value at one of the quotient of the yun zeta function by the Riemann zeta function. Um, but the question is, can you apply, that these guys raised, can you apply the Poisson summation formula to that sum over b? Well, not, certainly not as it stands. You've got your Poisson summation formula, you're not allowed to have coefficients. You could just have to have a sum of a Schwartz function over points in a lattice. Can't have coefficients. And you've got coefficients here, and they're very bad coefficients. They're not defined for, for all real numbers. They're just defined arithmetically for integers. Um, what else? Um, uh, there was some particularly trenchant point I meant to mention, which has escaped my mind, uh, but uh, um, uh, and in any case, that's the question that was raised. And Altu dealt with, there's about three or four problems that are raised. Um, uh, and he dealt with them for the case of GL2, one after another, very nicely. Um, this, the value at one of the zeta function, um, it's given only by a conditionally convergent series. Uh, that's very bad for doing analysis with. But he uh, replaced that value of one by uh, using the approximate, what's called the approximate functional equation, which uh, uh, replaces, it, 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 the price you pay is to ha have some extra truncation kind of functions or modification functions which you tack on to this and get a more complicated expression involving the orbital integral of f infinity, but then you get an absolutely convergent series of, uh, 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 where in which you take a sum over L uh, over the positive integers. You then, uh, and then there's further questions. Um, uh, uh, but in any case, I hope that one can, can um, solve these questions. I mean, there's, there, there's, it's considerably more to be solved here than in the case of GL2. Uh, one would have to be able to successfully use L'Alsperger's formulas for the orbital integrals. One would want explicit formulas. And, um, um, uh, but I, I hope uh, it, it should be possible to um, uh. Oh yes, I'm sorry, the point I wanted to raise was they, sa they said, look, why don't we apply, it would be great if we could apply Poisson summation formula to the sum over Zn. People have thought about this in the past, but not for, they didn't use the base of the Hitchin, Steinberg Hitchin vibration, that is to say, they didn't replace gamma by its characteristic polynomial. What they did was they simply took gamma to be an element in the multiplicative group of a field extension. But then they tried to apply Poisson summation formula to the, to the, for each of those uh, extensions of degree n. Langlands actually used that for GL2 in his book on base change. But it turned out not to, um, I mean, it looked very, pro I mean, it somehow seemed quite promising, but it didn't, it, it, it somehow has not. It, it's not quite the right thing. Um, so this does seem to be the right thing. Um, I mean, I mean um, by uh, applying Poisson summation, you are um, basically replacing this variable, the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial. You're re replacing it by a, by a dual, uh, or additively dual variable uh, by applying Poisson summation. And you hope that that would be more easy to compare with the spectral information, which of course are dual variables too. And the specific problem you would like to 
um, subtle by doing this is to be able to subtract away from the geometric side the contribution on the spectral side of the representations which are non-tempered, representations that occur in the discrete spectrum which are non-tempered. Um, uh, the kind of manipulations that Langlands proposes in Beyond Endoscopy um, are, are contingent upon the geometric side being a tempered <coughs> distribution. So these guys actually made a big deal about trying to subtract away the contribution on the spectral side for the residual discrete spectrum, the discrete spectrum, automorphic discrete spectrum, which is not uh, tempered, which is not cuspidal in the case of GLN. And uh, it seems likely um, Altu Al did this for GL2. It was just the one-dimensional representations, and he really showed that they corresponded to the spectral variable in, after Poisson summation formula. Uh, the, there, they would just be dealing with Z1, and so the spectral variables are parameterized by Z, and it's the value of that spectral variable at zero that corresponds to the trivial representation on the, on the, uh, the trivial one-dimensional representation, the one non-tempered representation in the discrete spectrum of GL2, which he <laughs> showed corresponded to this spectral variable, and uh, he subtracted it away and thereby obtained a, an action, a, a, a distribution on the elliptic uh, regular uh, pa uh, part, which I should say is tempered. Uh, you don't know it's tempered until you prove Ramanujan's conjecture, but which, which ought to be tempered. Anyway, I have gone a few minutes over. I am terribly sorry. <laughs> Thank you. This was a very excellent talk. There are questions? It, it, are there, is there speculation that I have a conjecture. It, it should correspond to divisors of n plus 1, mm -hmm. and so it should correspond to terms. Uh, uh, you're going to have n plus 1 spectral variables parameterized by z, and it should correspond to terms that are zero, have zeros in those, and then the remaining terms should be a diagonally embedded uh, tempered spectrum. So. Uh, so, so that corresponds to Mögler and Valsberger? It corresponds to Mögler uh, and Valsberger. They, they characterize the discrete non uh, cuspidal spectrum for GLN. And that would seem. Yeah, see, see uh, you can certainly, uh, you hope to see it, and it's, uh, there's a very natural, as I say, conjecture as to what it ought to be. Uh, namely, n tuples, n plus 1 tuples of uh, integral uh, integers. Um, such which have a zero at uh, regular places corresponding to a divisor of n plus 1, of all divisors, where you range over all divisors of n plus 1. Yeah. On the spectral side, do you expect to see an analog of this unit setup? No, no, this is purely for the uh, zeta functions, the L functions or zeta functions, uh, I mean, these are more simple than the, the automorphic L functions that would come on the spectral side. It's, it's purely uh, for the zeta functions on, on the geometric side. Yes. No more questions? And is a, a geometric contribution attached to gamma a residue of a global, a global zeta? Um, that plays a, certainly plays a role. Um, uh, I mean, even I mean, in the, even in the case of GL two, when you have applied Poisson summation, um, uh, it's no easy matter to isolate to, to prove that the spectral contribution from z from the spectral variable at zero to correspond that it gives the characters of the trivial representation, and the gamma functions play. And, and they're residues. I mean, it's a bunch, various residues of these things that uh, come in, and it's the, they do play a, a critical role uh, in, pro in, in proving uh, that, that, that you get the trivial one-dimensional representation, that Altu gets the trivial one-dimensional representation. Yes, yes. Okay. No more questions?
Well, he's trying to speak. Thank you. Thank you.